I do agree, for example, in the various instances uh, highlighted by a number of you, Mr. Christopher D'Souza, Mr. Yogok Kwang, Mr. Pritam Singh, Mr. Selina Chiam, Mr. Gantian Poi, Ms. Irene Ng as well. You've highlighted cases and of workers being housed in poor and hygienic conditions. I do know, because I accompany my officers when they go for inspection, and I've seen many of such similar cases. Does it mean that every single uh, accommodation in Singapore is in that fashion? No. Are there egregious cases? There are. But I would like to emphasize that these instances that we see, they are unacceptable. And in many instances, they already violate existing laws. Regulatory agencies will take to task any persons found to have violated the prevailing standards and ensure that the affected workers are relocated to approved accommodation. My officers are out every week inspecting, following up on leads, following up on tip-offs. Many of these don't make it to the headlines. What you see represents some of the cases that have been highlighted. Some have been tipped off by, through the media, some have been tipped off by the public, some by the NGOs, and they are valid because there are these cases and many more that our people see and we do need to deal with them. But does it mean that across the board the situation is dire? As highlighted by Ms. Fu Miha, we have taken this issue on board. We have tried to make sure that we survey the foreign workers in a large enough sample to understand what's the condition. Our surveys show that 9 in 10 foreign workers are satisfied with working in Singapore and an equally high proportion would recommend that their friends come here to work. Again, that does not mean that there are no egregious cases. So, for example, in terms of existing regulations, in terms of enforcement, last year, MOM alone took more than 1,400 employers to task for providing unacceptable accommodation to their workers. And we relocated close to 3,000 workers as a result of poor living conditions. We prosecuted offenders in egregious cases. Other agencies such as URA, NEA and SCDF have also taken errant premises owners to task for flouting existing re regulations which cover areas such as illegal subletting, inadequate bathing and toilet facilities and overcrowding. As a government, we are not only stepping up enforcement of existing requirements, but we are also continuing to review and to continue to raise these standards over time. And this is what we're going to do. This bill addresses one part of the issue, which is dealing with the dorms that are far larger. The rest of the other regulations continue to be in place and will continue to be tracked and will continue to be strengthened over time. With regard to Ms. Fumiha's query on how the locations of dormitories are determined, the relevant government agencies do take into account many factors, including technical and infrastructural constraints, like the suitability of roads, the adequacy of sewers in the area, as well as the recreational and social amenities that the dormitory can support. I would also like to assure Mr. Gantempo that similar care is taken in determining the capacity for each dormitory, as well as the number of dormitories allowed within an area. So this level of coordination is going on across government agencies and we do continue to want to strengthen that. And this may not always be apparent because this often takes place in the background. But this work will continue and we will continue to emphasize and strengthen the collaboration and cooperation across various stakeholders.